Right, um, so um, I am a final year PhD student at the Department of Archaeology, University College Cork. Um, my PhD um, generally concerns looking at the osteological evidence for violence from medieval Ireland and generally the, one of the main research questions or hypothesis that I'm examining is looking at um, changes or patterns of trauma from the early to the later medieval period as we would expect from the historical narratives that we know about the time. But one thing that I'm particularly interested in um, and which I'm going to talk about today is the mortuary practices associated with those who died violently and what it, that can tell us about not just the individuals but also about how they were viewed by society um, after death and how society treated them after death. Um, so to, I'm going to just start off with this quote um, from Sutherland and Holst and actually it's from a paper looking at um, the idea of conflict archaeology in Britain and more generally and it kind of sums it up very quite nicely because they say that human remains are a vital source of information on past conflicts as it can provide <coughs> evidence which might support or dismiss historical documents or propaganda. Human remains can provide evidence for the ferocity of battles, the types of weapons used and the way prisoners are treated, supply information either disrespect by mutilation or by the careful treatment, dignity and respect. So I think that's important to remember that it's not just for my own work, it's not just about the actual type of trauma encountered um, and the type of weapon used, but also about how the people were treated. <coughs> and just to kind of set this in context, I think that like to fully understand um, these human remains, we need to put them in their cultural context and looking at the mortuary practices is one way of doing this. Um, kind of different to other presentations that have been given, I don't have any above ground monuments. What I'm looking at is kind of the types of sites they're buried at. Um, the types of burials, so the way they actual are put in the ground and things of any inclusions of grave goods or animal bone or anything like that and matching it back then to the individuals. So um, here's a distribution map of all the sites with trauma that have been analysed for the PhD. Uh, there's 54 sites in total, um, kind of early and late and this is slightly more early than late but it's kind of everything that was available to analyse at the time um, in the last four years while I've been doing my research. Um, unfortunately, due to archaeological visibility, as any archaeologist knows, we're kind of constricted by what's been actually excavated. So there is this kind of clustering around the Dublin region, which matches development done in the last, um, probably the last 10, 12 years, and then kind of clustering around Galway. But as many sites as possible have been analysed. Um, and in many cases, I've reanalysed stuff that was excavated in the early period that's in the museum. Um, then, on top of that, these are the comparative sites that have been added to this, so sites that I didn't have access to the human remains myself, but I was um, lucky enough to get osteological reports from them. So to kind of just put the rest of the information in context. So to start at the early medieval period, um, what I've done is we've looked at site types and grave types, and then divided this out by the total population, by males and females, and then looking particularly at the type of trauma. And I'll come back to this later, but what I mean by the type of trauma what I've divided it by is sharp force, which is, which is caused by a sharp weapon, <coughs> blunt force trauma, which is caused by a blunt weapon. Um, some individuals have evidence of both. And then the timing of the injury. So you'll see these terms later on, but generally what I mean by this is either perimortem, which means at or around the time of death. And these wounds are generally the cause of death. There doesn't seem to be any healing on the individual. Or anti-mortem trauma, which is before death. And there is evidence of healing and the individual has survived. Or in some instances, skeletons of both. So they have evidence of both trauma that they've survived and then trauma that they haven't survived. So for the early medieval period, the site types that were identified were cemetery settlements, which are most common. Um, so these are cemeteries that, where we have burials and evidence of settlement, um, often things like iron working and things like that, but no necessarily ecclesiastical structure at the site. Um, and a lot of these sites have come to just to light in the last 10 or 12 years, there's no necessarily um, evidence of them on the surface, and they've come to light with recent development. Um, then deposition, we have deposition at a Cran at Cranog sites, and this kind of relates to one particular site. Um, there's some ecclesiastical sites, and then burial at liminal places. The burial types then, so where the actual individuals were buried, were simple earth-cut graves, lintel graves, like here at Own in County Galway, uh, pit burials, disarticulated remains, double burials, um, and then other kind of liminal places that I'll talk about later on. So, oh, sorry, we'll go back to that for one second. Um, so, as Elizabeth, Elizabeth O'Brien has stated, Christianity was introduced into Ireland into the 5th century, 
but the majority of the population continued to be buried in ancestral or familial burial grounds until the 8th century. This is probably related to the fact that deep-rooted traditions such as burial practices take a long time to change in society. So even after the introduction of Christianity, people were still burying in these uh, cemetery settlements or first their burial grounds with the rest of the family, and it took a long time for the shift into more formal ecclesiastical cemeteries. After this, so after the 8th century, it was more common to be buried at an ecclesiastical site. And by the 7th or the 8th century, the standard burial rite in Ireland was that of an extended supine in uh, inhumation, orientated west to east, interred in organised cemeteries of unprotected dug graves or lintel graves, which frequently have ecclesiastical associations. So kind of to sum up early medieval burial practices, it could occur at places marked by mounds or ring ditches, within or on the boundaries of kinland, within larger unenclosed cemeteries on kinland, or at other enclosed settlement sites containing burial grounds, without definitive evidence of churches, often referred to as the cemetery settlements. Deceased could also be buried at known ecclesiastical sites as well, but the documentary evidence notes that graves themselves were consecrated boundaries of religious beliefs, therefore people practising different forms of Christianity adapted within regional and local traditions could bury their dead in sites which had never been formally designated as Christian burial grounds. Burial rites at religious sites necessitated payment and may have been restricted to those of status or tenants of the specific ecclesiastical sites. And then over time, as we see, we move then towards this more um, kind of into more ecclesiastical sites. So when it's divided up, just to start off with some of the data, when, when, we, when I divided up all the individuals who have evidence of trauma, um, the total population with trauma, into looking at orientation of grave, you can see that the majority are buried in the normal west-east, 75% of them in this way. There are variations, as you see there, in the other kind of 25%. Um, it's very hard to know if these are actual deliberate variations, or in often cases, there's a lot of crowding at these cemeteries, there's intercutting, burials are placed in quite close to other burials, and sometimes it can just be that they're a little bit off, and it's to fit a burial in to an already crowded cemetery. What is interesting is there is no direct north-south burial, and there is documentary evidence that individuals who died a bad death or who um, may, may have died violently um, were buried kind of complete opposite, which may restrict um, basically resurrection, but there doesn't seem to be any north-south burials um, in the early medieval population with, with evidence of trauma anyway. So therefore, burial in this period was in itself a complex ritual and the location for burying the dead was not a straightforward mechanism that automatically occurred after death. Rather, it was caught up in social and political obligations to the dead and in many ways reflected what the living wanted from or owed to the dead. Um, grave types then, in terms of actually the what way they were placed in the ground, um, varied from earth cut simple graves to stone line graves, but the variation within these grave types was broad. At Johnstown alone, um, Johnstown 1 in County Meath, which was a cemetery settlement that dated from, I think it's from the 6th to about the 13th century, there was 11 different burial positions recorded at the site, including variations on the position of the arms and the presence of crouched or prone burials. So there's variations within this again. Um, few and remains also in the early medieval period have found to be disarticulated at sites, um, a practice which Matthew Seaver has pointed out was not an uncommon occurrence in the early medieval period for a number of reasons, inclu including possible use of human remains as foundation deposits at sites, to name but one. So when we divide the data then by burial type, we can see the majority, or 50%, um, over, well, half of the total were buried in just simple um, earth-cut graves. Um, when this data then was further broken down by sex, so by male or female, and by the different age profiles, so looking from adolescents right up to older individuals, you can see that it doesn't really change, and that's really because um, there isn't a huge amount of females represented in the population, and the majority, um, it kind of matches what, what we'd expect to see with the data. Um, this information is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, using this parameter of grave type alone, mm -hmm. it is apparent that those with trauma were buried for the most part in graves that were similar to the rest of the community. However, this will be further investigated when we look at um, what I mentioned before, so trauma type and evidence of healing in further slides. Um, the burial in a corn drying kiln is obviously kind of an unusual case, and I'll kind of talk about this a little bit further. Um, this individual was excavated at Colp West, County Meath, and consisted of a very badly decayed skeleton, which was found buried in the base of a later Iron Age or early Christian corn drying kiln. This individual was headless, and there was no space between the neck of the individual and the edge of the kiln, 
which would indicate, although there wasn't actual cut marks evidence on the skeleton to suggest decapitation, it would indicate that the body was placed in without a head. There was no space for a head in the killing. Um, this unusual positioning of this individual and the fact that he had perhaps been decapitated suggests a, a clandestine burial. The double burials as well um, are also worth discussing in further detail. Um, there's three of these in the group, in the early medieval group, um, one at Arhuskia, County Meath, which is a cemetery settlement, um, and one at Mount Gamble and one at Luss, County Dublin. These graves um, each contain the remains of two adult males, all of whom had been decapitated and with some other evidence of violent trauma. Susan Lee Fry has outlined um, in her book looking at medieval burial practices that medieval sources referring to warrior society of pre-Christian Ireland often speak of warriors being buried together. The poem Tulloch Owen tells us, Here rest a brave quartet in one piece, in one abode, for there were, as is well known, what that, deed read, that did red deeds of valour. Those are the ten sons of Stern Cahar, his six grandsons in one, to one tomb, a band of lions undaunted were they, here round Owen. So we have these poems that suggest that individuals who died together almost became family, they became brothers and they were buried together um, in, in a tomb and it was quite important. Um, there's another mid 13th century poem uh, looking at the Battle of Ballyshannon, which tells of three noble heroes who do not seek praise poetry are in one pale tapering limestone grave, a trio of warriors side by side. So an explanation for these graves may be the burial of males who died together in battle. However, it must be pointed out that double burials have been recorded at most early medieval burial sites with individuals buried in them with no evidence of trauma, such as at Johnstown 1, Partenhown uh, County Leash and at Mount Gamble County Dublin, to name but a few. And it's the fact that these individuals have trauma and are in a double burial that makes them unusual, not just the double burial alone. The disarticulated individuals here um, um, were all excavated from Lagore Cranog, County Meath, by Henkin and the Harvard Archaeological Ex um, Exhibition in the 1930s. It would be expected to find disarticulated remains with trauma, particularly with evidence of trauma at later medieval urban sites, and we'll look at this later on. So the discovery of remains such as these at an early medieval site is unusual. Um, it's likely that these remains relate to perhaps judicial practices of the site and were deposited there for a specific reason. So by looking at burial type alone, it can be seen that certain unusual burials are present among this sample of individuals with trauma, but for the most part, individuals with evidence for trauma were buried in the same manner as the rest of the community. Another important point to note is that in the sample of individuals buried at cemetery settlements and ecclesiastical sites, there appears to have been no segregation. So the individuals at these sites were not only buried in the same manner and laid out the same way and in the same orientation, they're not separated from the rest of the community. And that's what's particularly interesting, I think, is that we do have, there is documentary sources again that say that individuals who died violently should be buried at the north side of the church, but there doesn't seem to be segregation. They seem to be buried together. So when we look at this by site type, again, the most common site is um, a cemetery settlement and then Cranog liminal and then ecclesiastical. And this just reflects in general what I've said about go what's going on in the early medieval period, that the majority of burials are going on in these cemetery settlements that are not ecclesiastical sites. And ecclesiastical burial really hasn't come in as the most common burial practices until the later medieval period. So we see the majority, so 67.04% were buried at cemetery settlements. It's interesting considering that perhaps it would be expected that those who died violently would have been segregated. The documentary and archaeological sources would suggest that those of a dubious spiritual character or those who met their end suddenly, without a chance to make amends, were buried in a place apart. Slain men often died without last rites, so if you died on the battlefield, presumably you were going to die without last rites, and traditionally were buried, um, supposedly, on the less favoured north side of the church. And there are churches dedicated to the, to the solely to the slain, such as Relignor Fergunta or the Church of the Slain Men at Carrickmore County Tyrone, and at one of the churches at Inish Calter in Loch Derg, County Clare, which is known as Temple Nevergunther, or the Church of the Wounded or Slain Men. However, although these places existed in medieval Ireland, the individuals in the study were for the most part not separated from others in death. It was important, for whatever reason, that they were buried with the rest of the community. Also, the fact that perhaps that individuals who died by violent means were buried at ecclesiastical sites in the early medieval period is also of note. Um, there's only three individuals, actually. Um, one is a decapitated older male from Ardfirth, St Brendan's Cathedral in Ardfirth, County Kerry. And there's two individuals, it's an ecclesiastical site, but it also almost can, could be termed a liminal site as well. Um, and they were buried at Church Road in Lusk, County Dublin. The burials from Lusk were buried outside the monastic enclosure, 
It was two adult males buried in the double burial, as I've mentioned, and they were both decapitated. The 7th century Collectio Canonum Hibernensis outlines that there ought to be two or three termini around a holy place. The first in which we allow no one at all to enter except priests, because laymen do not come near it, nor women unless they are clerics. The second into which it streets the crowds of common people, not much given to wickedness, we allow to enter. The third in which men who have been guilty of homicide, adulterers and prostitutes, were permission and according to custom we do not prevent from going within. The extra excavator of Lusk, Aidan O'Connell, has suggested that the interred individuals at Lusk may have been members of this underclass, who were, who were kind of referred to in this passage as kind of the third group, and were denied access to the central and middle monastic precincts. So these individuals look like they represent maybe a barrier of two warriors, um, or two individuals who died violently, and were buried together after a violent event, but with a rest of a small group who may also be termed deviants. So when the individuals are divided by trauma, uh, the time of the injury, so as I said before, perimortem refers to a trauma that occurs at or around the time of death with no evidence of healing. Antimortem trauma refers to an uh, injury that there is evidence of healing and the individual has survived. And then we have some individuals that survive both. Um, and you can see it follows the same pattern. Kind of the majority are buried in cemetery settlements um, and in simple burials like the rest of the community. And then when it's divided up by shark force and blunt force trauma, it's the same thing, same patterns um, are emerging. Some things are of note, however, individuals with anti-mortem trauma, so individuals with evidence of healing, are confined really to the more usual burial practices. Um, <coughs> and this would kind of be expected if we think about how people are viewed in society. These individuals have survived the trauma, they've lived on for years later, and maybe they went on to live a good, the idea of the good Christian death. Um, but the individuals who have perimortem, um, sharp force injuries, um, are more <coughs> kind of look, they're basically kind of more confined to the kind of more unusual areas and the more unusual burial practices. Um, okay. So then just to look specifically at the decapitation burials from the sample, um, there's three main types of burial type we see with decapitations, and it's really related to the positioning of the head. Um, the first type would be where the skull is missing. Um, this is a kind of extreme example that we have from Umbridge County Galway of an adult male who was decapitated and his skull was missing, but he also appears to have been drawn and quartered from the multiple of trauma that was found on his skeleton. Um, there was 114 stab and cut wounds in total. So that's this individual here in the top left. Um, there's very few burials in both early and later <coughs> medieval Ireland with the skulls missing which is kind of interesting, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail, but when we think about why decapitation takes place, and the literary and the documentary sources talk about decapitation as a kind of taking trophies from a war, or decapitating someone, and the head is an important relic to take away, and there doesn't seem to be, we don't seem to see this in the archeological record. Um, and definitely this contrasts drastically with what is seen in the archeological record in Anglo-Saxon Britain and in medieval Britain. Um, so then we have, this is a double burial, actually one of the double burials I mentioned from Mount Gamble in Dublin. And this is an example of where the skull has been placed back anatomically. These are particularly interesting burials because, an like, a definite, the individuals have, the head has been decapitated, but when we excavate the grave, there's no evidence of this until the individual is analysed by an osteologist. The heads have been, there's a deliberate attempt to put the heads back in an anatomical position. In Britain, uh, just as a comparison, in Roman and Anglo-Saxon Britain, when heads are put back in graves, they were always put back in a non-anatomical position. They're placed at the pelvis or the feet. So that although the head's been put back, it's definitely not been put back on the shoulders, and it's a deliberate, very deliberate message you're sending across. And then finally, the would be just where we get skulls alone. Um, and these are more common in the later medieval period at urban or kind of castle sites where they dig pits of skulls, um, and these presumably relate to decapitation, the skull's been put on display, and then basically just been, when they no longer have serving their function um, of being put on display, they're just basically deposited into pits. Um, and then Ligore would be an obvious, an obvious early medieval example of this then. So. so this is perhaps one like an interesting facet of this data is when we see that there's a, the mo majority of individuals who are decapitated in the early medieval period have the skull placed back anatomically in the grave. In Celtic culture, the head was considered the most important part of the body. 
the heads of chieftains and warriors were flaunted, it is supposed, in order to shame opponents, and the portability of a severed head made it an especially suitable trophy of war. Christianity enhanced the meaning of head stealing because medieval Christians believed a corpse without a head would not be able to enjoy physical resurrection on the day of judgment. A variety of sources indicate that the Celtic cult of the head was still being practiced in Ireland in the medieval period and later. In 1185, Gilichrist MacCochmail, head, head of the Council of the North of Ireland, was killed and his head was taken. The fact that it was obtained by his people a month later may suggest that it had been held for ransom. The Anglo-Irish chronicle Grace's Annals contains numerous mentions of heads being taken as trophies by both the Irish and the Anglo-Normans alike, particularly between the years 1315 and 1318. Under 1315, for example, it records that Edmund Butler retaliated um, against O'Moore's attacks in, in Leash by killing a great number and bringing back 800 heads to Dublin. By the year 1315, William Common slew O'Byrne and 12 of his men and brought their heads to Dublin. The Irish of Email attacked Tullow and lost 400 men whose heads were brought back to Dublin. And John Hussey, butcher of Attenry, by the orders of his lord, went from Attenry by night to look for O'Kelly among the dead. He slew his own servant, and then O'Kelly and his servant, he brought back three heads to his lord. For this deed, he was knighted and gifted with great estates. So the fact that the crania of most individuals were replaced anatomically in the grave and were not separated from the postcranial skeleton suggests that display of the decapitated head was not a motivation motivating factor in these instances at least. Um, from the records we would expect that there has to be out there somewhere headless bodies but we haven't, they're not in the archaeological record as of yet. Likewise although heads were collected as relics throughout the medieval period the fact that the heads are in the graves in these instances rules this out as an explanation for the decapitations in this study. So perhaps a kind of possible tentative um, explanation for this would be an attempt to recapitate the individual after decapitation so that, that they were able to face God on the day of judgment to be judged for their crimes. By being decapitated on earth, they had paid their corporeal punishment. There was also numerous accounts of, of this kind of recapitation of basically skulls being reunited or heads being reunited with their bodies in the hagiographies. Um, and technically, the bodies of executed cr criminals could be buried in holy ground on the grounds that a man paid for his crime by his execution, if he was executed, and God would not punish a man twice for the same transgression. This is illustrated perhaps by the case of Lord William de Birmingham, a friend and supporter of the Earl of Desmond. De Birmingham was arrested in Clonmel County Tipperary and then hanged in Dublin by, in 1332 by order of Anthony de Lucy, the Lord Justice. Despite being in his favour with the government, de, de Birmingham was, giving a was given a proper burial at the Dominican Priory in Dublin. So that's kind of the, kind of to sum up like the early medieval burial practices. And then just finally, there was, I did a quick examination of the, looking at the grave goods and animal bone that's included. Grave goods is kind of a loose term. Obviously, a lot of it could be um, stuff that just gets back into grave fill. Um, so looking at the animal bone first, there's three individuals were found with animal bone inclusions in the grave. Skeleton 661, a younger middle adult male from Parknerhound County Leash, who had a healed wound on both his parietals, so healed trauma to the head, and a dog tooth um, was found in the grave fill. Burial tree from Lahinch County Offaly, who had a healed depressed fracture on the left <coughs> side of his skull and was buried with fragments of a horse tibia, pelvis and scapula, and a set of deer antlers with the tines pointing downwards. And finally, skeleton 87, a, young, a young, younger middle adult male who was decapitated and had a pig mandible on his pelvis. So the dog tooth looks like it probably was an accidental inclusion, but the other two examples seem to be deliberate inclusions of animal bones in the grave. Um, this practice is also seen um, at a later medieval site at one of the comparative sites I've looked at at Kevin Street in Dublin, where a male skull displaying evidence of weapon trauma was excavated with the skeleton of a dead dog seemingly buried with it. A way to dishonour a dead person and thus grievously insult the kin group was to place the corpse in contact with an animal. And we see this when Geraldus Cambrenesis and the author of McCarthy's book record that Dun Duncad, father of Dermot Murrah, was buried in, under the Dublin Assembly Hall with a dead dog as a mar mark of hatred and contempt. This type of insult was not unknown elsewhere in Europe. For example, Galbert of Bruges recorded that one of the murderers of Charles the Good, Count of Flanders, was hanged and a dog's intestines were then wrapped around his neck. Andrew Reynolds has noted in Anglo-Saxon Britain that there's quite a significant association between these decapitation burials at um, uh, basically execution cemeteries where they have huge amounts of decapitation burials. Um, and they found animal remains from things like neonatal lambs and dogs, particularly, being buried with these decapitated burials. Mm 
So the grave goods um, like that, they just seem to be, some of them seem to be accidental inclusions to things like the nail. Um, and the iron spearhead is really, it's not really a grave good as much as, as a spearhead that's been left in an individual. But there is two flint flakes buried with the individual at Lahinch, burial three, and a metal knife um, seems like it was placed um, beside the individual at Throat Oath. And these seem to be kind of um, deliberate inclusions, um, perhaps to, to denote status in life or just personal possessions that are buried with these individuals. Um, and although grave goods are not part of the normal Christian burial, they are, there are known examples of this in both medieval Ireland and further in field. So when we move on to the later medieval burial practices, um, they really haven't been, um, in terms of archaeology, it doesn't seem to be, have been as thoroughly investigated as those in the early medieval period. I think this is something to do probably with, like the research is largely centred on this big pagan to Christian transition and looking at how this impacts burials. And there just doesn't seem to be as much, there's a lot of stuff done above the ground, looking at monuments, but very little looked at below the ground. Um, this is also perhaps to do with the fact that the majority of excavations of burials from later medieval sites in Ireland, up until the 1980s really, were reinterred without much further analysis. So individual, so things like at Mellifont Abbey, the burials were never excavated. Um, so research has been scant until recent times. The majority of remains used for this research came from, for the later medieval period, came from ecclesiastical sites and were buried in and around the church in simple or stone-lined west to east burials with no apparent evidence of coffins. So we can see that the majority of individuals um, were buried just west to east and then a small amount were southeast to northwest, but that could still be um, explained for by the fact just crowding in the cemeteries and things like that. And it's much more kind of uniform burial than we see, um, or there's not as much variation as we see in the early medieval period. Um, so as we've seen already, the kind of late medieval mortuary practices um, change um, when the Anglo-Normans arrive in Ireland, and we get these new types of grave memorials in the form of effigies carved in relief and coffin-shaped floor slabs. These mainly marked interments within church and the effigies were more commonly the memorials of important individuals, usually bishops or lords. So like this example from Dunsany Church um, at Dunsany Castle, County Me, there were 15th century tomb, which is either of the first and second Lord Dunsanyan's wife. Um, and it's a 15th century example. The occurrence of sarcophagi carved out of a single stone is confined mainly to the Leinster region, the area most heavily settled by the Anglo-Normans. Tomb inscriptions in French in the 13th and early 14th century are also found in this area, but Latin was the, the language most commonly used for the tomb inscriptions up to the end of the 16th century. Um, it was only the wealthier classes who would have been commemorated in this way, presumably. The majority of the population continued to be buried in simple pits aligned west to east with the head to the west and cemeteries attached to the church. Okay. <laughs> um, right, I'm going to have to do this very quickly. <laughs> so another form of burial um, in this period is also the burial pits at urban sites and castles, which I've already mentioned. Um, so when we divide these up then by burial type, you can see there is a difference to the early medieval period. You see to have this, um, we have still a large proportion are being buried in simple, normal graves. But then we have this kind of new group that are buried in disarticulated pit burials associated with urban or castle sites. And you can see there as well, it kind of matches the two. There's also this move that we've seen from the cemetery settlement to the ecclesiastical site, um, which we mentioned before is about the normal transition from the early to the later medieval period. So when these are divided then by the timing of the injury, um, you can see that perimortem trauma, so trauma that there is no evidence of healing, is really confined to these urban or castle sites and disarticulated burials. And this would make sense if we consider that these individuals are decapitated and there's not going to be evidence of healing um, at the, in these individuals. And this is then um, related then again when we look at the type of injury. So it, it's mainly confined to the sharp force trauma caused by axes or swords is then confined to urban or castle sites and, and in disarticulated burials. And then this is another shift that we see between the early and the later medieval period. The, from the early period where the majority for the skull was being placed anatomically in, dis in decapitated burials, it's moved now to being the disarticulated skulls, so skulls that were being found in pits and uh, associated again with these urban or castle sites. I look again, it's a very similar situation. The animal bones seem to be just um, kind of accidental inclusions, uh, just put into grave fill. But there's a few objects um, with the graves, a flint knife again, which probably was a kind of deliberate inclusion. So then looking kind of then just quickly at the comparison between the two, um, we see that kind of the, the changes we see are expected. So looking from early medieval Ireland, the burials are primarily for everyone are kind of in cemetery settlements, 
and then as you move into the later medieval period, we're looking at kind of more ecclesiastical burials. What is interesting, I think, overall, is that there's not variation between these individuals who died violently and the rest of the, po of the population. And there doesn't seem to be segregation in, in communities, um, and they don't seem to be segregated from everyone else. They're not buried uh, prone. They're not buried like face down in the grave. They seem to be buried in a normal Christian manner so that they will uh, be resurrected on the Day of Judgment. And finally, um, as I've said before, these places existed, so things like Pimpol, the Vergunta, and so there was places like this in Ireland that you could bury slain or wounded men, but they're still being put into normal cemeteries. In Europe and Britain, we see these kind of mass graves associated with battles. So like this is from the Battle of Good Friday, a 16th century battle from Sweden. Um, we see an example in the 15th century in Britain from the Battle of Towton. Undoubtedly, these sites do exist in Ireland. They just haven't been excavated. And the battlefield project, um, the Irish battlefield project that was run between Headland Archaeology and Anclan would definitely has identified these sites. It's just there hasn't been any research or excavation of a site like this to date to kind of have a control sample to compare with the individuals who are buried in normal cemeteries. Um, thank you very much.